Welcome back everybody to the Raid Mastery series, the place where I will be revisiting every raid in the game, providing a concise modern guide full of tips, tricks, easy skips, and meta recommendations. In previous videos, I found myself mentioning that for the purposes of keeping them at a reasonable length, I would not go too in depth on the core mechanics, but ended up covering them anyway. So from now on, I will still give detailed descriptions of the modern strategies, but also continue to briefly touch on the core mechanics. So with all that cleared up, today we're diving headfirst into the most optimized raid in the game, Garden of Salvation. Entrance. To begin, in order to enter the portal to the Black Garden, you must kill every wave of adds that emerges from it. The best weapon for this and the following encounter is Trinity Ghoul. Any hunters on the team can try this short skip here. Make your way into the start of the raid and prepare for the first encounter. Embrace. Loadouts wise, all players should be using an Eager Edge sword for movement since there are no bosses to kill here, accompanied by Trinity Ghoul and a Kinetic Sniper to kill Cyclopses such as Succession. As for mechanics, the general premise is to move from room to room, killing enough adds to spawn an Angelic, using the tether boxes to unlock the next room, and repeat. At the same time, one or two players should stay behind in the previous room to pick up the Voltaic Overflow created by the Consecrated Mind to ensure the team doesn't wipe. To start, have four people link the first tether box and run ahead into the next room to spawn the first Angelic for the next tether, and the remaining two players should stay behind to pick up the Voltaic Overflow. If your running team is fast, only one Voltaic Overflow will be created, but if not, it's best to leave two behind just to be sure. Once the door to the next room is opened, two from the first group should stay behind, and the two that stayed behind initially should run ahead. Repeat the same pattern of swapping players and collecting overflows, and when it comes to the final stretch, assign any players who don't have the overflow timer to collect the remaining three overflows. Note, you can also pick up an overflow despite already having it, you'll just have to take the death. There isn't too much to say in terms of efficiency here without going way too in depth with things like frame rules, but for some more surface level stuff, you can perma flag by timing the killing blow on the Minotaur right before the flag interact is complete. In the clip here, I used a 4 times honed edge Izzy, but besides this, Xenophage also 1 taps and Succession 2 taps. The main reason you do this is to pull slower teammates while also giving them a flag. Furthermore, all champions in this raid die to a near direct or direct impact thunder crash, and by equipping Curas of the Falling Star, the range gap becomes more forgiving, giving you the potential to kill multiple champions in one crash, which will become important in the second encounter. In general though, just go fast and you should be all good. 1-2 skip. Garden of Salvation is renowned for its skips since technically you can reach the very end of the raid without completing a single encounter, and while I won't be showing that today, I will show some more practical skips that you can learn if you want to be more efficient. And also, normally I would show the skips during the transition segment, but for this guide specifically, the skips and transitions will have their own dedicated sections. Follow the route on screen for the full 1-2 skip. One, two, transition. Once you finish the first encounter, head down into the undergrowth and follow the route on screen to arrive at the first secret chest. I normally don't show where the secret chests are, but for Garden specifically, it's very valuable to hold onto any piece of raid armor you get, since the mods specific to this raid are some of the most potent in the entire game, more on this later. After everyone has grabbed the chest, proceed to make your way to the first encounter or instruct your 1-2 skipper to pull the team. If you decide to pull your teammates, you should ideally hit the perma, and to do this, simply shoot one of the adds right before the flag is placed. Undergrowth. Good loadouts for floaters and players activating subsides would be Arbalest, Forbearance and Eager, and players remaining around the start and on relays should be on Succession, Forbearance and Xenophage. The main goal of the encounter is to defeat a set of three Angelics at each corner of the map to then open the middle arena and after that defeat two more waves of Angelics to end the encounter, all while constantly tethering to each other's relay to gain the enlightened buff in order to break immune ad shields. The optimal way to split your team is to have two people stay at one and tether, 
two people go to two, two people go to four, and after two and four have tethered, both players from two go to three, and one person from one takes the now open portal to two and covers it. After all four relays have been tethered, have one player float between one and two, and another player float between three and four to keep refreshing the players defending each corner's buff. The entire gist of this encounter is speed, and certain things happen depending on whether you're slow or fast. As you progress the encounter, you will eventually notice a chat prompt that reads, the undergrowth defenses subside, which occurs once all ads on the map are dead, including Angelics. And depending on whether you're fast or slow to connect the four relays initially, this could mean one of two things. If the four corners are not connected before the defenses subside, this means you've delayed the spawn of the first set of Angelics, and as punishment for each relay not tethered by the time the defenses subside, you will receive that number of extra ad waves. Or number two, if you're fast and manage to connect each corner before the defenses subside, the next spawn of ads on any random side will be guaranteed to contain the first set of Angelics, which is known as zero subbing. Obviously, since the death of the Angelics is directly tied to the pace of the encounter, it's very beneficial to try and go for a zero sub. Unfortunately, the portal network is unavailable at the very start of the encounter, so if you want to increase your chances of zero subbing, you can instead perform a skate to get to each corner faster. Regardless of your team speed, it's worth knowing that you can actually predict the spawn location of each ad wave with 100% certainty. The rule for ad spawns is that the next wave always spawns to the right of the previous, in the sense that if the first wave spawns in the middle lane, the next will spawn in the right lane, or if the first wave is right, then the second is left. I also want to briefly touch on efficiently killing Angelics, which can be done in a multitude of ways. Xenophage is good because you can kill grouped ads in one shot, and Arbalest can pierce the Angelic shield. Unfortunately, they are both capable of three-tapping the Angelics. However, with any combination of Relay Defender, Radiant, or Matching Surges, this gets brought down to a two-tap. Once all four Angelic waves have passed, the middle of the arena will open up for the final stage of the encounter. Here, you will once again be tasked with defeating Angelics, the first of which will unlock the middle relay once killed. For the initial mid-tether, have the first few players tether, and shortly after, the defenses will subside again, and much like before, this means certain things will happen. When the first subside occurs, two Angelics will spawn in two directions, either top, bottom, left, or right, assuming the tether box is top. Additionally, two ad waves will spawn, and just like before, these ad waves spawn to the right of the Angelics. For example, if on the first subside there is an Angelic right and left, this means that an ad wave will spawn top left and another bottom right. Once you've completed the first wave, have everyone tether again, and shortly after, the next will occur. When the second subside occurs, four Angelics will spawn, one in each lane, and subsequently, each diagonal lane will have an ad wave in it. On the second subside, you will also have to deal with supplicants spawning with the Angelics. Once every ad is dead from this wave, the encounter will be completed. Consecrated Mind Consecrated Mind is a unique boss that can behave very strangely, so let's start with what not to use, which to name a few includes Grenades, Needlestorm, Cataclysm Nova, and especially not Galahorn. Using these loadouts will cause the boss to uncontrollably glitch out and move erratically. In terms of what to actually use, Izzy Rapid Fire Sniper Rocket Swaps are the way to go, and make sure to have one well or a source of Radiant plus Burst Supers like Thundercrash, Celestial Nighthawk, and Vortex Nova Bomb. Lastly, the perma for this encounter involves placing the flag right after you see a small blue pulse at the center of the relay. The best reason to perma here is to use your heavy ammo to kill Minotaurs initially, then rally again to fill your reserves for damage. The aim of the fight is to fill a randomly located relay with 30 Voltaic Motes, dropped by occasionally spawning Minotaurs. While this is happening, the boss will once again be creating Voltaic Overflows, but this time with some added steps to them. Begin the fight by assigning three players to the Moat team and three players to the Eyes team. Each of the three players in the Moats team should be on lookout for the Minotaurs and quickly dispatch them once found. There are two options here when picking up Moats. You can either pick up 10 Moats each three times, or five once, 10 twice, and five again. Whichever method you choose is dependent on, you guessed it, the speed of your team. If you're fast, do 10-10-10. If you're less confident, do 5-10-10-5. One thing to note about the Minotaur spawns is that they are entirely dependent on how many adds are alive at a given moment. The Minotaur spawn system essentially works on a mob cap where each ad alive contributes a certain amount to said mob cap, which basically means killing any adds besides Minotaurs will make space for a new Minotaur to spawn, provided the right amount of space is available and the previous Minotaur is dead. In order to get the quickest Minotaur spawn, after every Minotaur you kill, kill one to three goblins which should make enough space for a new one to spawn immediately. Only one Minotaur can be alive at a time, so make sure not to kill goblins before you kill the active Minotaur, since this will refresh the mob cap with more goblins, rather than a Minotaur. Supplicants also count towards this mob cap, so whenever you see them, kill them instantly. As for the eyes team, simply follow the boss and pick up the overflow it creates. Once inside it, quickly destroy the glowing eyes in order to prevent yourself from dying. If you're on the eyes team, a slug shotgun or a rapid fire sniper works best fitting all three in quick succession. Once 30 motes have been deposited at the relay, the boss will travel towards it and shortly after, damage will begin. Quickly destroy the glowing eyes and once his core is exposed, begin damaging. Make sure that you're actively following the boss because if not, he'll summon a barrier that you will get stuck behind, preventing you from continuing damage. If all is set up correctly, you should be in for a very easy one phase.
three, four, skip. While no one strictly has to do this, I'm going to show it anyway since in my opinion it's one of the coolest skips in the game and it took me many tries to achieve, so please enjoy. Three, four, transition. Not too much to say here, if you want to have a laugh, try playing King of the Hill on the windmills, and if you're super cool, try some of the well bounces from the three, four, skip. Keep in mind that the second secret chest is located here. After everyone has grabbed the chest, instruct your skipper to pull or simply make your way to the end. The perma for this encounter is fairly straightforward, simply place the flag once the boss health is at roughly 30%. Sanctified Mind. For the final fight of the raid, your loadout should consist of large magazine rocket launchers like Field Prep Clown Cartridge Hothead or an Envious Assassin Colt Comfort. Make sure you have a Galahorn this time, which should ideally be a Warlock running Reign of Fire, and since the boss is so far away, Tractor Cannon simply won't cut it here, so for debuff, you will need, at the very least, two Hunters running Deadfall Tether. Besides your rocket launcher, Trinity Ghoul is again an excellent pick, and I would also recommend running a Kinetic Sniper to deal with the Cyclopses that spawn. Mechanically speaking, the aim of the fight is to fill up both the blue and orange relays with 30 voltaic moats in order to unlock the corresponding tether box. This is done by sending teams of two players through the blue and orange portals opened by shooting the weak spots on the boss's body. To begin, assign two sets of two players to enter both portals simultaneously and have one player in each team collect 10 moats and the other the remainder. Once both teams are finished, instruct the mid player to pull them back by shooting the weak spots once again. The players who collected 10 moats should now bank at their corresponding relay and have the other two players who collected less re-enter their portals accompanied by the original mid players in order to quickly gather the total 30. Moats. Moving on, every time a weak spot is broken, the boss will do two things. Number one, he will delete a random chunk of the map, so be careful you're not caught in it. And two, a cyclops will spawn on the corresponding side, so remember to kill it since if they manage to hit you, you're pretty much dead. With the existence of power creep and raid mods like Enhanced Relay Defender, the need to double tether has become obsolete due to the fact that it's an overall net DPS loss. To start damage, kill the angelic to unlock the tether box and shoot it again to activate it. After the tether is complete, quickly run to the opposite relay for damage. But why, you may ask? Well, remember how I said that you should keep your raid armor? This is the place to use it. You see, the Garden of Salvation raid mods are perhaps the most potent of them all, purely due to the existence of Enhanced Relay Defender, which if you manage to have 5 copies of, provides a staggering 50% global stacking damage buff to all of your outgoing damage, but the catch is, you have to be in close proximity to the relay itself, which is why people place wells on the opposite relay during damage since the one used to tether is deleted upon successfully tethering. So, if you manage to get any raid armor and the regular or enhanced version of Relay Defender, please use it since it's literally free damage. For teams looking for a consistent 1-2 to two phase boss kill, depending on raid armor across the team, the easiest way to achieve this would be via the tried and tested method of doing a single boss tether and having the whole team rocket dump on the damage relay. However, for teams that are trying to secure the one phase and have a hunter or two lying around, the following strat is the one for you. Whilst this strat does rely on a somewhat specific team comp and a good majority of, if not all of the team, having raid armor with enhanced Relay Defender, it isn't too difficult to pull off and makes one phase 
phasing this notorious boss quite a breeze. To do this strat, repeat the process of single tethering the boss and have the other three members of your team stood at the damage relay, preferably with a well already placed. Then, after the boss tether is complete, if you have two hunters, have one of them tether the boss's feet to give your team tether for their ground rotations and have the second hunter tether him when he rises into the air. If you've only got the one hunter, then just have them tether whilst the boss is in the air to get the full worth of it. As for what the actual damage rotation for the team is, have the titan, if any, shoot two Galahorn at the boss and then pop their banner shield super and hold it for the duration of damage, all whilst the rest of the team are doing triple weapon swaps. Now some of you may ask, Llama, how do I do triple weapon swaps? Luckily for you, my good friend Mike has a video on his channel going over a few triple swap variations and which ones should be used for what encounters. But for the sake of this video, we're only going to focus on the Sanctified Mind triple swap method. To triple swap on Sanctified, you want to do the rotation in this order. Times 4 honed Izzy, reload Izzy, swap to secondary GL and shoot it, swap to rocket and shoot it, and repeat. If all goes well, your team would have secured a nice and easy one phase. After the boss is defeated, make your way down into the pyramid and the raid will be completed. Quickly before I go, I want to mention a fun fact that you probably don't know about the raid. Garden of Salvation is unique in that both boss encounters can be completed simultaneously, and even more crazily, the final boss can be started at any point during the raid, even right at the beginning, despite no previous encounters being completed. Obviously, in order to try this, you'd need someone to skip right to the end, but it's still crazy to think about. While technically three raids in the game have multiple bosses alive at a given time, these being Goss, Ron, and the recently discovered Crota's End, only Goss lets you complete both bosses simultaneously, which makes it truly unique in this regard. Anyway, thanks for watching and I hope you learned something. Oi, how are you doing?